Hello there, and glad you found my videos. I hope these tutorials on ternary phase equilibria will provide you with a fundamental understanding of how to read a ternary phase diagram in material science and engineering. Many materials in our field are made out of three different types of components and mapping their equilibrium states, what solids or liquids form at particular temperatures or compositions is really important, both from a fundamental and practical point of view. So I've made these tutorials. They're not exhaustive in explaining every single concept behind ternary phase diagrams. My goal is just simply to get you to where you can read them correctly and quantitatively. So I hope you'll enjoy them. There's gonna be five altogether. And if you make it through all of them, congratulations. And I'd be very happy if you would post any comments on each of them as you see fit. Good luck. These videos will assume that you have exposure to undergraduate level binary phase diagrams, such as eutectics and peritectics, and some basic thermodynamics. Such concepts are typically introduced into most material science and engineering undergraduate programs. Our goal here is to read and interpret ternary phase diagrams that are of importance to a material scientist, and in some cases to a mineralogist or geologist. Here's an outline of all of the videos. First of all, in this one, we'll present an overview just how we represent three component phase equilibria. And then we'll begin with solid state equilibria, looking at isothermal sections, phase compatibility, and so-called Alkamadi lines. The subsequent videos will then talk about solid liquid equilibria in these systems, where we will look at different ways of representing the phase equilibria using space diagrams, and we'll examine ternary invariant reactions. And then finally, we'll move to liquidus projections. Those projections we will find are very useful in interpreting and quantifying the solidification paths of different compositions lying within the ternary system. And our last video will look at the applications of those methodologies to looking at complex ternary phase diagrams. Our example will be the magnesium oxide alumina silica system. The videos are not meant to be exhaustive. We will look at the main features of the diagrams and their representation such that you can read them quantitatively and successfully. The references listed here provide a more in-depth description and indeed many of the approaches I'm using in these videos are based on the books by West and by Prince. So let's begin with an overview and look at solid state equilibria in these systems. Well, a ternary system, by definition, we have three independent components, and our phase diagram maps the equilibrium states of the system as a function of composition and temperature. Pressure can also be important, in particular in geology. We will ignore it here. In that case, the phase rule will tell us that for a three-component system, a maximum of four phases can coexist when we ignore pressure. When we look at representing ternary systems, we will cover 3D space models, where the composition is represented on a basal triangle and temperature is the vertical axis. Because these are 3D constructs, it can take time to get a sense of the dimensionality of the phenomena that we run into. We will also use liquidus projections, in which all of the various isotherms involving the liquids are projected onto the basal triangle and we'll look at 2D isothermal sections where the stable phases forming at a given temperature are shown on that basal triangle. And we'll begin with the 2D isothermal sections, restricting our considerations to solid state equilibria. We'll begin by looking at how we plot the compositions in a three component system. We use the so-called Gibbs triangle, which is essentially just a piece of ternary graph paper. We have three binaries along the edges, AB, BC, and AC, and we measure the percent of each component along the perpendicular bisectors of the triangle. For example, the percent A, pure A at the top, 
no A at the bottom, 80%, 60%, 40%, 20% as measured along this perpendicular direction. The same for B, except now we're working from this lower left corner, all B on the lower left, no B up here on the opposite uh, side of the triangle. And now looking at the percentages in green, 80% B, 60% B, 40%, etc. For C, here's our perpendicular bisector, pure C in the lower right corner, zero C on the opposite side, and working away in this perpendicular direction, 80, 60, 40, etc. Let's just test if we are on top of this by looking at the composition shown in red here. Uh, see if we can estimate what that composition is. So the percent of A, 40, working down here, we see 40% A for the red composition. Then being careful for the perpendicular direction to C, 40% C, and the remainder 20% B. So in this case, this composition, as I'd said, 40% A, 20% B, 40% C, or A.4, B.2, C.4. Now let's turn to ternary phase diagrams in the solid state. And here we're going to look at solid state isothermal sections, which represent the solid state stability at a given T. Uh, the example we'll show here is one where we have no solid solubility between A, B, and C, and so they're completely immiscible with each other. And so any composition that we pick in the middle of the system, where all three components are present, is just going to phase separate into pure A plus pure B plus pure C. And so those three phases coexist everywhere within the triangle. We connect the coexisting phases by what's called a tie triangle, shown here in red. The vertices then are placed at the compositions of the coexisting phases, in this case pure A, B and C. And we could use the lever rule to calculate the ratio of the phases present for any given composition. The way we do that for a ternary system is we draw a line from the overall composition through the coexisting phase that we're interested in, in this case let's say A, so we'll draw this line from pure A through the composition to the opposite side of the triangle and then by measuring the length Y, the length from our composition to the opposite side, divided by the overall length of the line X, then Y over X multiplied by 100 gives us the percentage of A in that particular composition. And we could do the same for B and C. Now there are many examples of solid state ternary equilibria where the solid state reactions are insensitive to changes in temperature. In other words, the solids maintain the same equilibrium state at all temperatures. In this case, then, a single isothermal section can provide a complete map of the solid phase stability. Now, when we fix temperature, we can have a maximum of three coexisting solids. And let's look at the possibilities. The first we just looked at is where there is no mutual solid solubility at all between the three components and everywhere within the triangle with three phase. The other extreme could be where the three components are completely soluble and therefore anywhere within the triangle for any composition will just have a single phase solid solution. Then there may be limited solubility and in this case the diagram can get to look a little bit more complicated. We'll have regions where B and C are soluble to some degree with an A and we'll call that the alpha region. Similarly for B, A and C can be soluble to some extent, forming a beta solid solution and a gamma solid solution over on the C side. In this case, in between these single phase solid solution regions, 
closer to the binaries, we can have two-phase coexistence. In this case, I'm highlighting between alpha and gamma. And those two phases would be joined by a tie line. But then within the triangle, we will have, again, three-phase coexistence. But in this case, not of three pure solids, but of three solid solutions, alpha, beta, and gamma. And so to represent this three-phase equilibrium, we again use the tie triangle, and the corners again represent the solids coexisting, but in this case, they're solid solutions. They're not pure. Well, most ternaries contain intermediate compounds, either along the binaries and perhaps within the ternary itself. Let's look at an example of the MORESI system. In this case, there are several compounds lying along the binaries between MO and SI and SI and RE. These, in fact, are line compounds. They show no solid solubility, and so we represent them as dots on the phase diagram, indicating there's no solid solution with anything. But now the issue is, when we go into the middle of the triangle, what phases can coexist? Which tie lines are stable? And the solid compatibilities, the tie lines that join two stable phases, are called Alcamadi lines. And Alcamadi lines cannot cross each other. And so it's possible here we could have equilibrium between MOSI2 and RE2SI. And if that was the case, these other two compatibility lines, Alcamadi lines, could not cross it. So the issue is how do we resolve this? How do we resolve what phases are present within the middle of the ternary system? And what we need to do is to divide the overall triangle into a smaller subset of three-phase compatibility regions. And to do that, we need the relative stabilities of these different pairs of phases. We could do that perhaps experimentally by making up a whole set of compositions, analyzing them using X-ray diffraction and seeing what's present. Or in some cases, if there's available thermodynamic data, we can calculate the stable Alcamadi lines. And we'll look at a couple of examples of both. Staying with the system we just introduced, there is in fact a whole set of enthalpy of formation data for all of the silicides within this uh, ternary system. And their enthalpies of formation are shown here on the upper right. Now, when we're calculating stabilities of phases, we know we should really be using the free energy. But actually, the difference in the entropies of solids is usually pretty small. And as a first approximation, we can just lose the enthalpy data to figure out what the stable pair of phases will be. So, let's calculate the possible stable reaction equilibria for the system shown. And what we're going to do is systematically work our way up the ternary system to see if we can figure out what phases are stable and what phases are not. So let's begin at the bottom here. And we could look at two possible cases where MO3SI plus RE are stable compared to RE2SI plus MO. And so I'm showing that in the form of this possible equilibrium reaction here. So which is stable? The left side, MO3SI and RE, which would be this tie line, this Alcamadi line, or the other side, which would be the other line? Well, we have the data to calculate this. When we plug it all in, we find the enthalpy of this reaction, which were approximated as the free energy, is positive which means then that the left-hand side is more stable. So now we know this MO3SIRE pair of phases is more stable than the other. In other words, this tie line between MO and RE2SI can never exist. It's not possible. So we'll get rid of it. So now we have our first 
stable solid state compatibility light. Well, there are two other possibilities. What if the phase assemblage between those two phases is not as stable as the other two new lines that I've introduced on the diagram? We can also calculate those from our thermodynamic data. First, let's look at what side is more stable, MO3SI plus RE, or RESI plus MO, this line. Put in the data, we see delta H is positive, indicating again the left side is stable. So our original line is holding up, if you like. We can do the calculation for the other possibility, looking at the stability relative to MO plus RESI2. Again, that enthalpy is positive. And so now we know that MO3SIRE is definitely a stable Alkamadi line, and we can get rid of those other two. OK, let's continue up the diagram. Let's look at the stability of MO3SI plus RE2SI, this tie line, versus the other one. RE plus MO3SI2. We have the data. Let's represent our reaction, see which side is stable. In this case, we see the enthalpy is negative. Free energy, we're saying, is negative. And so the right-hand side is stable. So MO3SI2 plus RE is more stable than the other possibility. So let's get rid of the other one. And now we see this is a stable tie line. Working our way up, let's look at the relative stabilities of these two pairs. MO3SI2, RE2SI, MOSI2 plus RE. We see this case, the enthalpy is positive. The left-hand side is more stable than the right. And so, in this case, MO3SI2 plus RE2SI is a stable phase assemblage and we can enter it as a stable Alkamadi line on our phase diagram. Next, let's look at these two, two phase possibilities. Which is more stable, the left or the right? Put in the data. Enthalpy is positive. The left-hand side is stable. We'll get rid of the unstable tie line. Replace it by the stable one, shown here. Now, as we work our way up, Systematically, let's look at these two possibilities. Again, enter it as a chemical reaction. Put in the data. Negative, the right-hand side is stable. MOSI2 plus RESI, so this is not a possibility. We'll get rid of it. There we go. Now, there's only one possibility. We must have a stable Alkamadi line between MOSI2 plus RESI2, so we can just enter it without any calculation. And there's our complete set of solid state compatibilities figured out from our thermodynamic data. So now we can identify all of the three phase sub triangles within the system. And there they all are. So within the middle of every triangle, three phases coexist. What are the three phases? The ones at the vertices of the triangles. And again, we could use the lever rule, etc. if we picked a given overall composition to figure out exactly what we have. The example shown here is an overall composition shown in green. It lies in that three phase region. So in this case, MOSI2 plus RESI plus MO3SI2 will be the stable phase assemblage that will form. And as I just mentioned, we can use the lever rule to be more specific in figuring out the relative amounts of each phase. Let's turn to another example where we're mapping a ternary through experimental observation. And here we'll take the zirconium boron carbon system, which is a very important ceramic system, 
as within it there are very high melting point compounds. For example, zirconium diboride has a melting point of over 3,000 degrees, one of the highest known. And materials within this system have been explored as coatings for hypersonic flight and rocket propulsion, where those vehicles have to resist extremely high temperatures, and they need to be coated by a material that can resist melting at those extreme high temperatures. Here's a picture of the compounds that are known in this zirconium carbon boron system. They're basically line compounds. We'll just assume there's, there's no solid solubility. And let's see if we can map the ternary diagram in the solid state, given a few observations. First of all, we're told here that zirconium diboride is stable and it does not react with carbon. So if I took zirconium diboride and carbon, they would not react, they'd coexist. And so therefore, from a phase diagram point of view, these two must form a stable line in the phase diagram. And let's put it in. Well, if that's the case, now we can see on the left side here, within this region, we're going to have to break it down into two more sub-triangles. There must be a tie line between ZRC and ZRB2, because that's the only possibility. That's the only way to split it up into two smaller triangles where three phases coexist. So let's pop it in. Now we'll work on the right side. There's still a few possibilities here. For example, ZRB2 could coexist with B4C, or it could be carbon and ZRB12 that are stable, one or the other. Well, let's look at this experimental observation. We're told here that ZRB12 reacts with carbon to form B4C. So that tells us if carbon and ZRB12 react together, they don't form a stable two-phase assemblage. They react to form something else. And so we can get rid of that as a possible tie line and enter the other one, which is B4C ZRB2. Now, down here, we've got another line to put in. There's only one possibility. B4C and ZRB12 must be a stable assemblage. Let's put the line in. And we have successfully broken this larger triangle down into areas where three phases coexist, just based on two or three carefully selected experiments or experimental observations. And here are those three phase regions. Now let's just quantify the phases that are present for a certain overall composition in this system. Let's say we had a sample that contained an equimolar mixture of zirconium, carbon and boron and what phases would be formed. So overall, equimolar, one to one to one, zirconium to carbon to boron. So in other words, we have 33.3 mole percent of each component. And here is that overall composition shown on the phase diagram. Well, let's look at the tie triangle where the composition is lying. It's located in the triangle shown here, and our stable phases then are ZRC, carbon, and ZRB2. We can also quantify the relative amounts of the phases. And to do that, we'll use the lever rule applied then to our tie triangle. Again, remember the length away from the composition to the opposing side of the triangle over the overall length that would allow us to quantify the percents of each phase. Here we just blow up the tie triangle. And if we go through, look at those measurements, we'll see we have 16%, roughly 16.7% of carbon, 33 and a third percent of ZRC, and 50% zirconium diboride for this sample composition. When it comes to verifying that we have mass balance, that those phase compositions agree with our overall composition. I just want to make a point that sometimes confuses students. 
And that is when we're doing this verification, we should use the mole fraction formula for the compounds. In other words, ZRC, in the phase diagram, it's actually ZR.5 carbon.5, and ZRB2 is a third mole fraction of zirconium, two-thirds of boron, i.e. ZR.33B.67. Now when we go through and look at the total atomic percent of boron based on these phase compositions, boron then is only contained in ZRB2, but we write that as 0.33.67 as shown. 50% of the sample is that, so that means we have 33.3% boron. Now doing the same thing for zirconium. Zirconium is located in ZRC, 33%, as well as in ZRB2. So we take 50% of our ZRB2, written in the mole fraction way, plus 33% ZR.5C.5, then out comes 33.3% zirconium. And finally for carbon, 33.3% ZRC, writing it as 0.5.5. And then for elemental carbon, we can leave that as it is, 16.7%. Add them up, 33.3%. So we obtain a mass balance that's in accordance with our overall composition. Well, many ternary phase diagrams also contain ternary compounds. So the definition of a ternary compound is one that contains all three species, A, B, and C in our examples. And as I note here, there are numerous important technological materials that are based on ternary compounds. A well-known example is the high temperature superconducting oxide systems based on copper oxides, in particular BAO Y203CuO, shown here. In this system, BA2YCu3O7 was the first material discovered with a superconducting transition temperature that was above liquid nitrogen. The TC of the compound is 92K. And you may know that in the superconducting state, it will levitate in a magnetic field. So here is the phase diagram of the system that was determined experimentally after the discovery of superconductivity. And the need for the phase diagram was such that purification of the compound could occur and identification of impurity phases could be conducted in a reliable and quantitative way. So here's an, an isothermal section again. This particular one is at 900 C, was where it was done experimentally. But the phase stabilities really do not change too much with temperature. So it's a reliable guide as to what compounds we would obtain if we heated various mixtures of these components in the solid state. We can see the system contains three ternary compounds, one here, here, and the high TC superconductor highlighted in red. And so there are many three-phase subtriangles. The Alkamadi lines were determined experimentally through extensive X-ray diffraction studies, and now we can see all of these many different subtriangles. In what areas does BA2YCU307 appear? Well, I think now we're comfortable with reading the phase diagram. Obviously, the pure compound would exist at this particular composition shown, but anywhere in these other triangles surrounding it, it would form as one of the three stable phases. Now we know something about how to represent ternary equilibria in the solid state using isothermal sections. Our next task is to move up in temperature and start melting our ternary compositions. And now things can get a little bit tricky as we have to start thinking in three dimensions. And we'll begin that in our next video.